uh, this this large groundswell of opposition to to the nuclear energy establishment. And there were fears that uh, even the Soviet Union or China could take advantage of this situation, and it's in the competition for loyalties after World War II. So again, the, the juxtaposition of images old and new. So on the left, uh, officials from the city of Tokyo testing the tuna from the Lucky Dragon and finding severe contamination. But like Cindy talked about, some of that tuna had already been sold, had already been consumed before it was, it was quarantined. And then on the right, this is actually an image from Thailand, not from Japan, but also dealing with the contamination of seafood post Fukushima. And uh, this was brand new to me that I learned from uh, my visit to Antioch. So um, a part of the United States response to try to shore up Adams for Peace was to actually deploy the Central Intelligence Agency to Japan. And this individual on the left is Louis Strauss, the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. And the Atomic Energy Commission took a lead role in downplaying the significance of the food contamination in Japan. And this individual on the right, Shiriki, a uh, fascinating story um, compared to Citizen Kane of Japan, a media mogul who controlled one of the largest newspapers, one of the largest television stations in Japan, had higher ambitions for political office, was a founder of the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan. And in 2006, it was documented that he was uh, working with the Central Intelligence Ag Agency under a couple code names. And one of his assignments was to sell nuclear power to the Japanese people, and he did it with a passion. And so the, the infamous nuclear village was born, and this image is just one example. The speaker from the investigation by the Japanese parliament showed other images of the propaganda used. This is a plutonium boy, and of course these are geared for children. And uh, so exhibits were shown across the country just as they were here in the United States, uh, traveling exhibits. And I, during my time in Japan in 2010, I went to one of these kind of Disneyland-like experiences at a nuclear power plant, which are really geared for young children. And one of the first companies to uh, take advantage of this situation was uh, a company that Mr. Shiriki worked with, and that was General Dynamics that got in early on the nuclear business in Japan. But, but um, General Electric was not too far behind. So here's uh, you know a grand total of about 140 atomic reactors in the US. Uh, 104 are still operating, but you got to take off Crystal River, Florida, 103 now. Take off Kewanee, Wisconsin, 102. Uh, Sorry that Canada is not on the map because there are, you know, 20 plus reactors in Canada, but take off Jean T2 in Quebec. So there are dominoes on the brink of tipping over and we need to shut them down before they melt down. This is Atomic Japan, third only to the United States and then France with 58 reactors, Japan with 54 plus Manju, the fast breeder reactor. One of the places in Japan, Fukui Prefecture, a remarkable number of reactors, more than a dozen, along a short stretch of coastline. And what I want to do for the next section of the talk is just go through the parallels between U.S. and Japanese nuclear history in terms of accidents, incidents. They're remarkably parallel. And what I took was just an arbitrary list. The Associated Press, shortly after the beginning of the Fukushima catastrophe, put a list of you know, a short list of 10 or so Japanese nuclear accidents that had already occurred before Fukushima. So I took that list because it could be much longer and I compared it to ones here in North America. So you see on the left, uh, Suruga nuclear power plant, but you see on the right, the Bruce uh, nuclear power plant in Ontario. This is worker overexposures. So in 1981, 300 workers were exposed to excessive levels of radiation. After a fuel rod ruptured at Suruga, and it reminded me of an incident in uh, Michigan at Big Rock Point, an uh, experimental atomic reactor, where a MOX fuel rod was broken in the 1970s and 700,000 curies of radioactivity were, were released. But Bruce is also on the Great Lakes in Canada. 
And uh, just recently, in 2009, there was an exposure of hundreds of workers to alpha particle radiation when they were grinding through contaminated pipes. They had no respiratory protection on. And before moving on from the Bruce slide, I just wanted to mention that this is one of the biggest nuclear power plants, certainly in North America, it's the biggest, and even in the world. There's a total of nine reactors on this site. They're even proposing a low and intermediate level radioactive waste dump for all of Ontario's 20 reactors worth of wastes, a burial site, 400 yards from the water of Lake Huron. But there are a half dozen communities, mostly populated by Bruce workers, that want to be the high level radioactive waste dump for all of Canada. And the Great Lakes is 20% of the world's surface fresh water, drinking water supply for 40 million people in North America. So this next, uh, parallel is sodium fires. And you see Manju and Fukui Prefecture suffered a bad sodium fire in 1995. Uh, videotape footage of the damage was concealed for a time and then later got released. But um, Fermi Unit 1 in Monroe County, Michigan suffered a sodium fire, suffered tritium leaks in 2008. And what's remarkable about that is it had permanently shut down in 1972. These were decommissioning accidents at Fermi 1. Fermi 1 was made famous or infamous by an October 5th, 1966 partial meltdown of the reactor core captured in the book, We Almost Lost Detroit. So talk about a cover-up. That was a 10-year cover-up of a partial meltdown in Michigan until John Fuller wrote this book. The next uh, parallels reprocessing plant fires and explosions. Now this is a lesser known accident at Tokai Mura in Japan. Uh, March 11th, 1997, ironically the same date as the later Fukushima catastrophe. And uh, 40 workers were exposed to radiation in this reprocessing. Yeah, I've got a problem because I can't see my notes on this screen. So the parallel in the United States is right here in the state of New York at West Valley near Buffalo, a commercial reprocessing facility that operated from 1966 to 1972. But they had so many fires and leaks and worker overexposures at West Valley that they only did one year's worth of reprocessing throughput. They also did military reprocessing at that site. And the cleanup bill at West Valley is between 10 and $27 billion. And it's not even hardly begun. And if they do not clean that site up, it is going to erode into Lakes Erie and Ontario over time. So it has to be cleaned up. So the more uh, infamous nuclear disaster at Tokai Mura was the inadvertent criticality of 1999. Two workers died from their radiation exposures. And another inadvertent criticality took place in 1999, but again, the truth was covered up for eight years, and it wasn't known that there had been a 30-minute, uh, I believe, criticality in the reactor core. Sorry, 15 minutes. Uh, and a similar thing had happened at Fermi Unit 2, which I'll show on this slide. Fermi 2, which is the biggest General Electric Mark 1 boiling water reactor in the world, same design as Fukushima Daiichi, only as big as Units 1 and 2 at Fukushima Daiichi put together. They had an inadvertent criticality in 1985. And the watchdog, Michael Keegan, with Don't Waste Michigan, outed it, and it kept that reactor shut down for three years because they, they didn't have a permit to run the reactor. They just did it accidentally. Luckily, no one was hurt. So the safety cover-ups uh, continued. Tokyo Electric Power Company, the book about Tokyo Electric is called Dark Empire. So it starts to capture their uh, their behavior. So um, in 2000, three TEPCO executives were forced to resign after the revelation that in 1989, the company had ordered an employee to edit out footage showing cracks in nuclear plant steam pipes in video that was shown to regulators. Of course, they eventually were allowed to restart their reactors. And uh, there was another cover-up in Japan that was outed by the Japanese anti-nuclear movement. Eileen Miyoko Smith at uh, Green Action told me this story. The British Nuclear Fuel Limited MOX fuel supply with falsified um, quality assurance figures that it took tremendous efforts to uh, document this, but they did, that those were falsified figures. They simply photocopied the results of earlier batches, so to speak, cut and paste. 
which caused a huge delay in the plutonium thermal loading in Japan. So another cover-up I want to mention here in the United States is Davis Bessey, Ohio, which had a, a massive corrosion hole in the lid of the reactor in 2002 and operated to within three sixteenths of an inch of breaching the lid through nearly seven inches of carbon steel. And again, cover-ups. Video footage was edited before the NRC was allowed to see it. This photograph, though, the NRC had in its possession still did not take action. This is a, a lava stream, so to speak, of boric acid crystals and rust coming off of the lid. And the former NRC chairman, Richard Meserve, his fingerprints are all over this near disaster. Junior inspectors at NRC wanted to shut the plant down, inspect, see what was going on. Meserve and other senior management at NRC allowed the reactor to operate to the brink of disaster. And the Office of Inspector General at NRC later reported that NRC had prioritized company profits over public safety. Meserve resigned shortly after that report and uh, unfortunately is still brought to Tokyo as in December for consultation on nuclear safety matters. He also is the chairman of all things nuclear at the National Academy of Science, even though he serves on two for-profit nuclear utility corporate boards, Pacific Gas and Electric in California and Comanche in Texas. And, uh, through grassroots activism, was forced to recuse himself from the current radiation study on cancer incidents associated with nuclear power plants in the United States. So more examples of the, the close parallels between the U.S. and Japan. There have been not radioactive, but steam accidents where workers have been killed. So at Mihama, Unit 3 in Fukui, again, four workers were killed after a steam explosion. The subsequent investigation revealed a significant lack of systematic inspections at Japanese nuclear power plants. Surrey in Virginia, which David Lockbaum mentioned yesterday, may have cleaned up its act a bit after two separate steam fatality accidents. Um, one killed two workers in 1972, another one killed four workers in 1986, and that's the single largest loss of life uh, at a at nuclear power plant in the United States. Surrey's also infamous because they're experimenting with dry cask storage out there. They have a real smorgasbord of different cask models, and they've had problems. They've had leaks of the inerting uh, heat transfer gas um, out of one seal, perhaps out of a second seal. It hasn't leaked completely out, but if it does, oxygen can get in, the waste can overheat, and you can have corrosion of deterioration of the fuel inside. So um, this